he headed for home. He lived with his father in a two-bedroom apartment above his father's shop in Greengate Square, the small item shop, which sold things like nails, pins, tacks, clips, springs, jarlids, doorknobs, bits of wire, shards of glass, chunks of wood, and other small things that might be useful in some way. The small item shop had overflowed somewhat into their apartment above, in their front room where other people might display a nice teapot on a tabletop or a few attractive squashes or tomatoes on a shelf, they had bucks, buckets and boxes and baskets full of spare items for the shop. Things Dune's father had collected but not yet organized for selling. Often these items spilled over onto the floor and made it easy to trip over things in his apartment and not a good idea to go barefoot. Today, Dune didn't stop in the shop to see his father before going upstairs. He wasn't in the mood for conversation. He removed two buckets of stuff from the couch, and it took it looked mostly like shoe heels and flopped down on the cushions. He had been stupid to think he could understand the generator just by looking at it when other people had been working on it their entire lives. The thing was, he had to admit, he'd always thought he was smarter than other people. He'd been sure he could learn about electricity and help save the city. He wanted to be the one to do it. He had imagined many times a ceremony in Harkin Square organized to thank him for saving Ember, with the entire population in attendance and his father beaming from the front row. All Dune's life, his father had been saying, you're a good boy and a smart boy. You'll do grand things someday. I know you will. But Dune hadn't done much that was so grand so far. He ached to do something truly important, finding like finding the secret of electricity, and as his father watched, he'd be rewarded for his achievement. The size of the reward didn't matter. A small certificate would do, or maybe a bot badge to sew on his jacket. Now he was stuck in the mud with the pipeworks, patching up the pipes that would leak and break again in a matter of days. It was even more useless and boring than being a messenger. The thought made him suddenly furious. He sat up and grabbed a shoe heel out of the bucket at his feet and hurled it with all of his might. It arrived at the front door just as the door opened. Dune heard a hard thwack and a loud ouch at the same time. Then he saw a long, lean, tired-looking face of his father in the doorway. Dune's anger drained away. Oh, I hate you, father. I'm sorry. Dune's father rubbed the side of his head. He was a tall man, bald as a peeled potato, with a high forehead and a long chin. He had a kind, slightly puzzled gray eyes. He got me in the ear, he said. What was that? I got angry for a second, said Dune. I threw one of those heels. I see, said his father. He brushed some bottle tops off the chair and sat down. Does it have to do with your first day of work, son? Yes, said Dune. His father nodded. Why don't you tell me about it, he said. Dune told him. When he finished, his father ran a hand across his bald head as if smoothing down the hair that wasn't there. He sighed. Well, he said, it sounds unpleasant, I have to admit. About the generator especially, that's bad news. But the pipeworks is your assignment. No way around it. What you get is what you get. And what you do with what you get, though, that's more important. Wouldn't you say? He looked at Dune and smiled a bit sadly. I guess so, said Dune. But what can I do? I don't know, said his father. You'll think of something. You're a clever boy. The main thing to is to pay attention. Pay close attention to everything. Notice what no one else notices. Then you'll know what no one else knows, and that's always useful. He took off his coat and hung it from a peg on a peg in the wall. How's the worm? he asked. I haven't looked at it yet, said Dune. He went into his room and came out with a small wooden box covered with an old scarf. He set the box on the table and took the scarf off, and he and his father both bent over to look inside. A couple of limp cabbage leaves lay on the bottom of the box. On one, on one of the leaves was a worm about an inch long. A few days before school ended, Dune had found the worm on the underside of a cabbage leaf he was slicing up for dinner. It was a pale, soft, green, velvety smooth all over with tiny, stubby legs. Dune had always been fascinated by bugs. He wrote down his observations about them in his book that he had titled Crawling and Flying Things. Each page of the book was divided lengthwise down the center. On the left, he drew his pictures with pencils sharpened to a needle-like point, 
moth wings with their branching patterns of veins, spider legs, which had minute hairs and tiny feet like claws, beetles with their feelers and their glossy armor. On the right, he wrote what he observed about each creature. He noted what they ate, where it slept, where it laid its eggs, and if he knew how long it lived. It was difficult with fast-moving creatures like moths and spiders. To learn anything about them, he had to catch what glimpses he could as they lived their lives out in the open. If he put them in a box, they scrambled around for a few days and then died. This worm, though, was different. It seemed perfectly happy to live in the box that Dune had made for it. So far, it only did three things. Eat, sleep. It looked like sleeping, though Dune couldn't tell if the worm closed its eyes or even if it had eyes, and expel tiny black poop balls. That was it. Ha, I've had it for five days now, said Dune. It's twice as big as it was when I got it. It's eaten two square inches of cabbage leaves. You writing this all down? Dune nodded. Maybe, his father said, you'll find some interesting new bugs in the pipeworks. Maybe, said Dune. But to himself, he said, no, that's not enough. I can't go plodding around the pipework, stopping leaks, looking for bugs, and pretending there's no emergency. I have to find something important to do down there. Something that's going to help. I have to. I just have to. Chapter 4. Something Lost, Nothing Found. One day, when Lina had been a messenger for several weeks, she came home to find Granny had thrown all the cushions from the couch onto the floor, ripped up a corner of the couch's lining, and was pulling out wads of stuffing. What are you doing? Lina cried. Granny looked up, wisps of sofa stuffing stuck in the front of her dress and clung to her hairs. Something is lost, she said. I think it might be in here. What's lost, Granny? I don't quite recall, said the old woman. Something important. But Granny, you're ruining the couch. What will we sit on? Granny tore a bit more of covering off the couch and yanked out another puff of stuffing. It doesn't matter, she said. I'll put it back together later. Let's put it together now, said Lina. I don't think what's lost is in there. You don't know, said Granny darkly. And she sat back on her heels, looking tired. Lina began cleaning up the mess. Where's the baby? She asked. Granny gazed at Lina blankly. The baby? You haven't forgotten the baby? Oh, yes. She's, uh, I think, down in the shop. By herself? Lina stood up and ran down the stairs. She found Poppy sitting on the floor of the shop, enmeshed in a tangle of yellow yarn. As soon as she saw P Lina, as soon as she saw Lina, Poppy began to howl. Lina picked her up and unwound the yarn, talking smoothly, though, though she was so upset with her that her fingers trembled. For Granny to forget the baby was dangerous. Poppy could fall downstairs and hurt herself. She could wander onto the street and get lost. Granny had been forgetful lately, but this was the first time that she had completely forgotten about Poppy. When they got upstairs, Granny was kneeling on the floor, gathering up white tufts of stuffing and jamming them into the hole she had made on the couch. Oh, it wasn't in there, she said sadly. What wasn't? It was lost long ago. My father told me about it. Lina sighed impatiently. More and more, her grandmother's mind seemed caught in the past. She couldn't explain the rules of pebble jacks, which she had played last, or which she last played when she was eight, or tell you what happened at the singing when she was twelve, or who she danced with at Cloving Square when she was sixteen. But she would forget about what happened the day before yesterday. They heard him talking about it when he died, she said to Lina. They heard who talking? My grandfather, the seventh mayor. And what did they hear him say? Ah, said her grandmother with a faraway look. That's a mystery. He said he couldn't get at it and now it's lost, he said. But what was it? He didn't say. Lina gave up. It didn't matter anyway. Probably the last thing was an old man's left sock or a hairbrush. But for some reason, the story uh, had taken root in Granny's mind. The next morning on her way to work, Lina stopped in at the house of, the, of their neighbor, Evelyn Murdo. Mrs. Murdo was brisk in her manner and in her, and in her person, thin and straight as a nail. But she was kind and in an unsmiling way. 
Until a few years ago, she had run a shop that sold paper and pencils. But when paper and pencils became scarce, her shop closed. Now she spent her days sitting by her upstairs window, watching people in the street with her sharp eyes. Lina told Mrs. Murdo about her grandmother's forgetfulness. Will you look at, in on her sometimes and make sure that things are all right? She asked. I certainly will, said Mrs. Murdo, nodding twice firmly. Lina always... Lina went away feeling better. That day, Lina was given a message by Arbin Swin, who ran the Calais Street Vegetable Market, to be delivered to Lina's friend Clary, the greenhouse manager. Lina was glad to carry this message, though her gladness was mixed with a little sadness. Her father had worked at the greenhouse. It was still felt strange not to see him there. The five greenhouses produced all of Ember's fresh food. They were out past the Green Gate Square, at the farthest edge of the city. Nothing else was out there but the trash heaps. Great, moldering, stinking hills that stood on rocky ground that were lit by a few flooding highlights on the poles. It used to be that no one went to the trash heaps but the trash collectors who dumped the trash and left it. But now and then a couple of children might go there to play, scrambling up the sides of the heaps and tumbling down. Lina and Lizzie used to go there when they were younger. They'd pull out an occasional treasure some empty cans, maybe an old hat or a cracked plate, but not anymore. Now there were guards posted at the trash heaps to make sure that no one poked around. Just recently, an official job called Trash Sifter had been created. Every day, a team of people methodically sorted through the trash heaps in search of anything that might at all be useful. They'd come back with a broken chair leg that could be used for repairing window frames, bent nails that could become hooks for clothes, even filthy rags stiff as dirt that could be washed out and used to patch holes in window blinds or mattress covers. Lina hadn't thought about it before, but now she wondered about the trash shifters. Were they, were they there because Ember really was running out of everything? Beyond the trash heaps was nothing at all. That is, only the vast unknown regions where the darkness was absolute. From the end of Diggory Street, Lina could see the low, long greenhouses. They looked like big tin cans that had been cut in half and laid on their sides. Her breath came a little faster. The greenhouses were a home to her in a way. She knew that she most li was most likely to find Clary somewhere in greenhouse one, where the office was, so that's where she headed first. A small tool shed, st shed stood beside the door of greenhouse one. Lina peeked in but only saw rakes and shovels, so she opened the greenhouse door. Warm, furry-smelling air washed over her, and all her love for this place came rushing back. Out of habit, she gazed up toward the ceiling as if she might see her father there on a ladder, tinkering in a sprinkler system, the temperature gauges, and the lights. The greenhouse light, light was whiter than the yellowish light of Ember Streets. It came from long, thin tubes that ran the length of the ceiling. In this light, the leaves of plants shone so green they almost hurt Lina's eyes. On the days when she had come here with her father, Lina spent hours wandering around the gravel paths that ran between the vegetable beds, sniffing the leaves, poking her fingers into the dirt, and learning to tell the, pl the plants apart by their look and smell. There were the beans, the peas, and the curly tendrils, the dark green spinach, the ruffled lettuce, the hard pale green cabbages, and some of them as big as a newborn baby's head. What she loved best was to rub the leaves of the tomato plant between her fingers and breathe in the pungent, powdery smell. A long straight path led from one end of the building to the other. About halfway down the path, Clary was crouching down by a bed of carrots. Lana ran toward her and Clary smiled, brushing the dirt from her hands, and stood up. 